grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're continuing on in our theme of justice this month of November, in particular looking at how latter Old Testament prophets prophesied regarding justice and injustice. And every week we're kind of picking a kind of another theme because there's a lot of a fair amount of overlap between uh, what these prophets say, but um, we can't cover everything in one in one sermon. And so I'm picking some different themes that really kind of out across uh, the prophets. And this week we're kind of talking about sin and social justice or social injustice, uh, basically kind of looking at things from a society perspective, not only from an individual perspective. Uh, Zephaniah was prophesying during one of the least faithful times in Judah's history. It's not long before Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. The problem with Judah at this time was not just one bad apple. Rather, society itself had gone to pot. Also, Zephaniah is not addressing a first-time offender. Judah was a habitual offender. They'd been through, if we want to put it this way, rehab several times and been repeatedly slapped on the wrist, warned, and yet they continued to give God the middle finger without even making a pretense of turning their life around. Reading reading contemporaries of Zephaniah, like prophets Jeremiah or Ezekiel, uh, provides confirmation that things were, in fact, really bad. Now, one challenge for modern readers to reading Zephaniah is that he sounds pretty harsh. However, God's justice is not something that we need to apologize for. It's it's actually a good thing because you can't fix the problem until you first identify that there is a problem and then you do something about the problem. Now, there's a lot of overlap, as I said, among these minor prophets, but some themes keep popping up like social justice or maybe social injustice. And social Justice or social injustice really means it's not just one crazy individual who's doing something wrong or who's out of control, but it's unfairness that pervades the the whole society. And so, it only makes sense, if evil is widespread, then, uh, well, and society-wide injustice means it's evil that's widespread and often widely accepted by much of society. Uh, Most people don't notice or realize or think there's anything wrong, they just accept it as the way things are. Now I think we probably all know there's plenty of injustice in this world, uh, all kinds of different, but it's it's different when injustice becomes personal. This is kind of a small example, everyone turned out okay, but I was in college when my brother got mugged in Denver, Colorado. He was working for AmeriCorps And he was not doing anything wrong. He was walking with a group, and uh, somebody came up behind him, and one person stopped him, and another person came up behind him, and I think he was even handing his wallet over. But because he was the biggest guy in the group, to make a point, they hit him on the back of a head with a bottle or something and knocked him unconscious. Now, I was, when I got that, I was, you know, yes, there was nothing I could do. I was in West Lafayette, but uh, then I was even more angry when I heard that they caught the guy. But I don't remember exactly what, but something went wrong. Somebody didn't do something they were supposed to, and so they got off without an issue. Um, So there was injustice in my book, and that was a relatively minor case. Because it was my brother, I was was really upset. Um, But there wasn't much I could do about it. Uh, Imagine uh, a Cincinnati official was using your tax money to throw a lavish party, or uh, go to strip clubs or something. Uh, how upset would you be if you lost your personal pension because uh, people had mishandled your money or wildly wasted it? Injustice may not seem like that big of a deal uh, until we experience it. It's different when it's personal. And justice is always personal, because it always affects a person or people. Now, we think 
as human beings, and especially as Christians, we understand that mistakes happen. But the problem is when they're widespread, the resolution probably be appropriate if it was a widespread solution as well. Um, now, Yahweh cannot simply accept the widespread evil that is going on among his people in Judah during Zephaniah's day. I mean, it's bad enough if it goes on in the surrounding nations, but Yahweh is personally involved here. He's attached his name on this people. I imagine, again, it's bad enough when injustice goes on, but what if it was happening within your own family? If someone within your family was doing something uh, uh, unscrupulous and harmful. The pervasive and pernicious level of corruption in Jew has reached a, a point at this point, a level at this point, so that it's no longer just about Judah. And it's no longer just about Judah's name. It's about Yahweh's reputation that's at stake too. Now, I imagine you wouldn't want your pet uh, to go biting people, right? or perhaps uh, your, your child to be out of control and a threat to society, would you? I mean, if you could do something to stop that from happening, I imagine you would, or, or maybe you've done something like that. Um, this whole scenario is starting to really reflect poorly on Yahweh, and people are starting to think or get the idea, frankly, that he's just like all the other corrupt gods. So not just because of a personal vendetta, but because it's the reputation of the Lord and the hope of the world for a salvation is being compromised. And so Yahweh steps in and does something. Um, when God made the 12 tribes of Jacob his people, he took on some responsibility for them, right? Now he's so appalled at what the people that he's raised are doing that he can stand it no longer. Now, I imagine that most of you, if not all of you, are, are familiar or uh, maybe appreciate a favorite Wild West plot line. It uh, gets wild out in the West, right? And eventually, people get hurt when things are out of control, when criminals start running things. So that's when you got to call in the sheriff, right? And the sheriff doesn't come in to file an ordinance or complain publicly. He claim, comes in to speak a language even criminals understand, gun smoke and hot lead. Well, Yahweh's return at this point in Judah's history is kind of like the sheriff coming to town. It's simply reality that more civil and gentle approaches are no longer going to work in this situation. So Zephaniah announces that the sheriff, going to get you, is coming back to town with both guns blazing. And that's why the day of the Lord that Zephaniah talks about is a day of wrath, a day of ruin and destruction, a day of judgment for those who are running and ruining my people, says the Lord. If you were watching any sort of movie, you would be cheering for the sheriff to do exactly this sort of thing. But after all this doom and gloom in Zephaniah, the end of the book takes a shocking pivot to those, and begins to talk to those who have repented. And Yahweh speaks astonishingly comforting words, rejoicing over his people, shushing their fears, and lifting their spirits with his promises and presence. It starts off with a lot of heavy law, but it ends with some beautiful gospel. Well, how about us? Let's shift to our day and our responsibility. And uh, The church still needs to preach repentance but we are also called to heal the hurting people. In fact, I think we want to take and adopt the same sort of attitude as Yahweh adopts, which may sound bad, but it's really good, because he corrects, but only until he has to. But what he delights in is comforting and helping. That's what we, too, are called to do. And, and uh, we are called to call others to repent and to speak the truth in love, uh, but we are also called to heal and to help. Perhaps when we talk about society and there's any myriad of problems we could address, we can't change maybe how society does things as a whole. But that doesn't mean we have to accept or condone evil, right? In fact, we have a responsibility 
not only to our neighbor, but to God. And, and, and that's a, a big piece of the puzzle that is added uh, as Christians. It's not only about just doing what's right, but we have accountability that someone is watching and that we owe it not only to our neighbor, but to God to do right by others. It doesn't matter if we can get away with it in front of our fellow human beings. The Lord knows. We are expected and required, in fact, by God to treat people in a certain way. He knows what's going on, and He expects us to do what's right, good, whether it's easy or not. As far as it is in our power, so, therefore, we ought to encourage a fair and just society around us. Now, um, it, sometimes we can do that in a small way by being involved in politics, but I think probably more, in my book, more importantly, we can do things about the world that is around us. And it, it's a good thing for Christians to be trying to make this world a better place. Involvement in good causes are, and just causes are excellent things. That's not necessarily the primary goal of the church. But I think the New Testament's attitude is that we, when we have an opportunity to heal, we should. Jesus usually wasn't going around looking to do miracles. I mean, read the Gospels. He wasn't required to do them, and that's often not what he was intending to do at first. However, when Jesus ran into people who were hurt, his compassion and care for creation and humankind compelled him often to do something. And it's in that sense, it's making the world, making the world a better place our most important goal because ultimately, we need Jesus to do that in a full, big picture sort of way. Like Jesus, we are here first and foremost to point to repentance and trust, and, us, and for us, we point to Jesus. Um, however, just like Jesus, the Holy Spirit compels us so that we can't just help ourselves. We can't help ourselves. We've got to help others of hurt and injustice in the world around us, and we're not all going to be passionate about the same thing, but if you're loving your neighbor as yourself, that's a good thing. If Christians were going to adopt a social justice motto, it would be simple, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, that's not really a, a principle, it's like, okay, oh yeah, I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. I know I'm supposed to do that. Well, that's not, the, that's not the point. We're supposed to actually do it. It's not a principle. It's a call to action. God calls us to love our neighbor. A biblical worldview, uh, our view, when it's informed by the Scripture, we see injustice as a blemish on God's good creation. Imagine if you had something broken in your house, you'd probably at least intend to get around to fixing it, right? If you had something really, that really bothered you or was out of place in your yard or your garden, I'd imagine you'd want to fix it. And the bigger the problem was, the, the more you'd feel like you'd want it fixed. Well, the whole world is the Lord's. And a properly working world is certainly much more important than a garden or an untidy bookshelf. And so we sometimes have the opportunity, when we see something that's out of place, we sometimes the have the opportunity to help tidy our world up a bit. Now, sometimes we have to use law, but what we're really always looking to do use is the gospel and to heal. Of course, this comes with the caveat, as long as there are sinners in this world, it's going to remain imperfect. It's always going to be a... a, a, a a challenge for us to, to move in the right direction. And we are awaiting the day when Jesus will make all things new. We won't ever be able to completely fix it because Jesus is going to only, Jesus alone and God, uh, the triune God is the only one who can really do that in a full sort of way. And there's no shortcut. Um, but we know that, but we could adapt uh, two different attitudes about that. We could say, well, life stinks. I give up. Or we could say, thank God. Lots of projects to work on. 
We could complain, God, why is this world so messed up? And sometimes it's appropriate to do so. But we don't want to stay there too long. We want to eventually be praying, Lord, what can I do to make this a little better place? The good news is we're not alone in this. The Holy Spirit will help us and lead us. God has created you and me in part to do good works. Um, there's plenty of problems out there for us to address. And one reason, one major reason we're still here on earth is to address the ills of society. Again, both with the big picture promise of salvation and renewal in Christ, the only true and lasting solution, but also with a foretaste of the feast to come, if you will, meeting people within their suffering and coming alongside them because the compassion of Christ compels us. The Lord sometimes gives us the great privilege of helping others and passing on the grace and help of Christ that we ourselves have already received. In Jesus' name, amen.